Now, as they went on their way, he entered a certain village where a woman named Martha welcomed him into her home. She had a sister named Mary who sat at the Lord's feet and listened to what he has to, to say. But Martha was distracted by her many tasks. So she came to him and asked, Lord, do you not care that my sister has left me to do all the work by myself? Tell her then to help me. But the Lord answered, Martha, Martha, you are anxious and troubled by many things. There is need of only one thing. Mary has chosen the better part, which will not be taken away from her. In the name of the Father, Son, Holy Spirit. Amen. Dearest Lord, thank you for gathering us here together in this virtual space. We ask you to um, quieten our hearts and just like Mary, um, allow um, space to listen um, to you and what you have um, in store for us this evening. Glory be to the Father and to the Son and the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now and ever shall be, world without end. Amen. Okay, so uh, good evening, everyone. So my name is Gary. Uh, some of you don't know me, but I, I think most will know me. Uh, I'm a Wednesday day disciple. So I hope you had your dinner uh, because today's uh, guidelines is all about food. And uh, I hope you won't be hungry after listening to me. Okay, so anyway, uh, one of the fringe benefits of being married, at least to my wife, is that my parents-in-law are very good cooks. And so when I first knew Serene some 20 years ago, uh, they will invite me to, uh, to their place for a meal. And they will take a lot of pains to prepare a sumptuous meal for me. You know, uh, even to today, you know, every meal comes with a, a soup and the soup is the Cantonese style soup, very, very nutritious and with steamed fish. And then even plated like restaurant style, you know, got, got uh, fine china. I mean, even talking about this, I even can smell the aroma coming from the kitchen. So even today, right, my children, who is uh, teenagers, also look forward to go to my uh, parents-in-law's place every fortnight. And every time somebody cannot go, they will just lament how they are missing out on all the good food. Now, each meal has to be planned in advance. Uh, um, my father-in-law will actually go marketing uh, in the morning, you know, and different market, you know, Baru to buy the chicken and go don't know where to buy the fish, you know, um, so that the food is the freshest, all right? And, and on the day, they'll be very busy preparing. So we cannot change the schedule. If we are going, means we are going. Each meal is prepared with a lot of love, but it also comes with some effort. Lah. So during dinner, my mom-in-law will be very busy. She will be hardly at the table with us. If she's not serving, she's washing up or preparing some dessert or something like that. And we always tease her, you know, hey, come and join us. Lah. But she said she can't stand seeing the, the kitchen so messy. So she's like washing while, while, while dishing. And then when we are almost halfway done, she will come over with uh, to have a food. Lah. But most of the time, instead of having food, she's like dishing more food for us. So, but we are all very happy to oblige, right? And we also know that it is her love language. It is really her joy to see all of us enjoying the family meal. But then it's not always the case because uh, um, since my father-in-law is quite a good cook, actually sometimes the relatives will ask them, hey, why don't you cook for the whole extended family? You know, like in Chinese New Year or something like that. And, and also my father-in-law at some point in time tried to start uh, some food business, lah. But during these occasions, uh, the cooking is no longer a joy. It becomes a, a real chore, you know, and the husband and wife get upset with each other. They get stressed. And sometimes they have very big quarrels, even just getting ready for hosting. So while the intent is all good, um, the tempers will start to build up when there's time pressure, there's stress and anxiety. You know? So of course, the story in Martha and Mary is set around such a setting. And it's a very familiar passage uh, to all of us. And Jesus are good friends with this household. So actually, this friendship is very interesting, right? Because it really shows the humanity of Jesus. 
And sometimes I also ask, you know, how come, how did this friendship begin? You know, because uh, Mary and Joseph, um, sorry, Martha and Mary's family uh, house is quite far from Galilee where, where Jesus is uh, lived. Um, and in fact, Bethany is just outside uh, Jerusalem. So maybe, uh, just, just, hy uh, just hypothesizing, right, that uh, maybe at that time um, when people go for the Feast of Passover, um, some people will rent out their homes, just like uh, Airbnb style, you know, so that people can uh, stay there. So, um, so maybe Jesus got to know Mary and Martha and Lazarus because he stayed in their home when they are young, you know. And over the years, um, they develop a friendship. So over time, Mary and Martha would have come to realize that their friend is uh, actually someone special. And so in this instance, uh, when Jesus came over, um, Martha is trying to make a very nice dinner for Jesus, but she didn't get the help that she wanted from her sister. And therefore, Martha famously complains, Lord, tell her to help me. Martha is not happy that her sister, who, who as far as she can tell, is just sitting around doing nothing. So most of us, when we hear this story and Mar Martha and Mary, is uh, remember is is for us a symbol of two aspects of our spiritual life, uh, activity which is represented by Martha, and contemplation that is symbolized by Mary. And in this story, uh, set in the Gospel of Luke, uh, this this story of Martha and Mary comes right after the parable of the Good Samaritan, and we all know that this talks about the Samaritan that goes out of the way to help someone in need. And it is an act of external charity that Jesus praises. But in this case, Jesus praised Mary instead for her contemplative attitude. And if you have been following uh, us in the past few weeks, you will know that this series um, is centered on Pope Francis' Lenten message of 2024, which um, has the theme through the desert, God leads us to freedom. So last week, uh, Sister Letty shared with that we must have this true conversion. You know, um, not just uh, uh, it's, it's a change of values of priorities in order to experience God's gift of freedom. Today, we want to try to understand that action and contemplation are not two unrelated acts. As Pope Francis says, Prayer, almsgiving, and fasting are not three unrelated acts, but a single movement of openness and self-emptying. He continues, Lent is a time to act, but to act also means to pause, to pause in prayer in order to receive the word of God, to pause like the Samaritan in the presence of a wounded brother or sister, Love of God and love of neighbor are one love. So what did Mary do to earn the praise of Jesus? She sat at the feet of Jesus like a, like a disciple to allow him to speak and to listen to what he has to say. Hence, the basis of loving one neighbor is founded from a life of prayer. External acts of charity, if not properly fed by a constant relationship with Jesus, is not going to endure because we are not just called to love in a human way. The good acts of Martha, although commendable, miss the point, and the point is love. And, evid and evidence of this is precisely the attitude of Martha. Her need to be seen as a good host led her to become self-centered. If you notice, she's the first one that actually scolds Jesus. Because when she's saying, Lord, do you not care that my sister left me by myself to do all the serving, she's actually telling Jesus off. So what is Mar uh, Jesus' response? Okay, Jesus said, Martha, Martha. And, and, and here you notice the double use of her name, Martha, Martha. It shows actually a, a, a form of intimacy that, um, that actually is quite interesting because we often hear of Jesus speaking to his disciples or, or challenging some of his uh, Pharisees. But... In this case, it's very rare to hear um, him talking to friends, you know, and he's speaking to Martha as how a friend would correct another friend. 
So she, he says, Mother, Mother, Mary has chosen the better part. So the attitude of Martha and Mary are somewhat benchmarked to each other, active and contemplative life. And we also need to put together active and contemplative life in order to grow in love. Therefore, love is the fundamental reference to understand if our active and contemplative life are in good stand. If every time we do good things for God, but it does not lead me to have a personal relationship with, with Jesus, then it means that my act of charity is not going to endure. They are actually done for myself, not for God, nor for my neighbor. On the other hand, a life of prayer devoid of action also can have the same problem. Because every time my prayer does not enhance my love for my neighbor, then my prayer is like me and me, you know? And if we remember the prayer of the Pharisee in the temple, he was praying and, and he was praying, but really he's not praying in the presence of God. You know, his neighbor and God were actually in the background. So every time our prayer does not lead us to love others, that means our prayer is also not doing so well. Hence, our Christian life can be understood in the light of something above active and contemplative life, which is love. And the reference is the love of Jesus for us, which is of course a divine way of loving, a love nurtured by grace, a love that actually pays a price for it, and, and in the case of Jesus, to the point of offering his life for us. Now, what actually hinders contemplative life? Why is it so difficult to truly develop a contemplative life? The answer lies in the analysis of Jesus' response to Martha. In Luke's account, it says that Mary was distracted with much serving. And Jesus said to Martha, you are anxious and troubled by many things. Now, being distracted means being put away. And if you are talking to someone and someone is checking his or her phone, you can sense that he's distracted. Okay, and of course, our world is full of distractions. I, I mean, probably in the time of Jesus and even more today, right? And unless you are purposely going to shield yourself like going to the desert, I mean, it's impossible to avoid it. Even I'm watching the news, I, I see there's a rolling feed of another news, you know, as if, if that news is not... Just in case the news is boring, there's other news to create emotional reactions, fear, anxiety, and greed in our minds. So there's, there's so much distraction. But not just being distracted. Uh, Jesus says, Martha, Martha, you are anxious about many things. And Martha has a lot of things on her mind. So like, like most of us, I'm sure you have a lot of things on your mind. I also have a lot of things on my mind. Right, I mean, some things are, are are genuine concerns. I mean, really, I mean, work. I I work. There are things to do. Uh, there's unfinished work. Um, there's competition. I have to think about. There's um, there's distractions. There's opinions of others. The social media, and I'm sure you have them too. You know, and and if we have a sharing, you you probably can many things to tell me of what you're anxious and upset about, but. The issue is that when we focus on the so many issues, then we have a kind of splintered consciousness. Or oh, I worry about this, and then, oh, it reminds me of something else, and yesterday this happened, and tomorrow that's happened. And then, and then we get divided. And that's why we become anxious and worried. And that's where Jesus said, there is only a need for one thing. Mary has chosen the better part. Mary has chosen the one thing necessary. Jesus is not saying, oh, don't worry about anything. You know, he's saying that amidst all the things that you are concerned about, underneath all this surrounding, all this conditioning, all of this, there is one great concern, and that concern is God. And when you are focused upon God, then you can understand how many other things fit in your life and 
the rest of the things become secondary or tertiary, no longer the primary things to worry about. So under all these things, then the great thing is God. And God is not one thing among many. You know, I'm worried about tonight I have to give guidelines. I have to worry about the conversation later or yesterday or what's going to happen next. And then I'm worried about God. And then I'm worried about my high cholesterol. No, no, no. It's not like that. It's that among all these issues, God is bigger than all these issues, right? And therefore, when I'm focused on God, everything in my life tends to fall in the right place. So when Jesus tells Martha not to be anxious, he actually uses the same word that occurs in Luke chapter 12, verse 22, when he said to his disciples on the Sermon on the Mount, do not be anxious about your life, what you are about to eat, or your body, what you are about to wear. For life is more than food, and body is more than clothing. He says that your father knows that you need all this. Instead, seek first his kingdom. So if you, are love God, if you love God, then you are properly focused on God, then the rest of your life will fall in harmony and you will do the right thing and you will find the right way to order and organize all the many things. So how have been my own Lenten journey? One of the things that I've tried to do this Lent is to begin every day in the morning before I start work to spend 20 minutes or so in prayer. I read the daily readings or just sit in silence or maybe just talk to Jesus. The point is I begin the day consciously focused on the one thing necessary. It is a way to put all my anxious concerns in the right place. They don't disappear. I am still have concerns about things, but I try to place them within the context of seeking first the kingdom of God. And that way, Martha and Mary can both become and come together. So perhaps during this next 20 minutes or so, let us be like Mary, who in the midst of all the activity, the busyness of life, sit at the feet of Jesus, put away our distractions and anxieties, and start to appreciate that God himself is a master chef. When we go to him, he prepares a feast for us, and he prepares it with love, where he offers himself as bread. Then the words of Pope Francis, or in the words of Pope Francis, our entrophied and isolated hearts will revive. The contemplative dimension of life, of life that land brings, help us to re rediscover and release new energies. So let me end by bringing us back to Martha. Uh, don't underestimate her role. Despite being uh, uh, scolded by Jesus, her friendship with Jesus teaches us a lot of things. In fact, she's the first among the three siblings that is made sin uh, by the church. She had the opportunity to play host to Jesus, to let him try her cooking. So as we approach the fourth week of Lent, and almost more than half, we realize that Lent is, is a journey. It's like a metaphor for life. And so is food preparation, right? We too, with our creativity, with our love, have an opportunity to cook up a special dish for the Lord with our lives. Each of us, with our lives, prepare a dish for the Lord. What spices do we add in? What fresh aroma do we wish to elicit at the dinner table? Listening to him, knowing his taste, what then will be our signature dish? So with that, um, we will take about 20 minutes. Uh, we'll come back um, at 8.50 to give thanks. Mm -hmm.